Hey guys, so here we are on the respiratory system. We're going to talk about the upper respiratory tract uh, structures first. So basically the stuff before you get into the lungs. And then we'll talk about the lower respiratory tract, which is also known as the respiratory tree for reasons that will become very obvious to you. Let's get into it. So all of the, all of the respiratory structures are located in the thoracic cavity and the lungs are inside a subdivision of the thoracic cavity, which is called the pleural cavity. When you see the word plural, plural refers to pertaining to the lungs. And so um, if you look at this one, the whole the entire cavity is the thoracic cavity. The division between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity is the diaphragm. And the diaphragm is also going to be important for breathing because when it contracts, it changes the volume in the thoracic cavity, which changes the pressure. And that's how ventilation or breathing happens. So above that is the thoracic cavity, then we have the pericardial cavity where the heart is, and then the two um, pleural cavities, which are on the sides. So the pleural cavities, those are going to be where the lungs are found. And those pleural cavities um, have two, a pair of serous membranes, and we've already seen these words as well. Remember that serous membranes come in a pair, you have one directly lining the organ itself. So on the very, very outside of the lungs, so sort of stuck on sort of as part of the lungs itself, that would be the visceral pleura. So visceral as in lining the organ, pleura related to the lungs. And then lining the, um, the pleural cavity, which is really just the inside wall of the, th of the rib cage. Okay, so inside wall rib cage, that would be the parietal pleura. And serous membranes secrete a fluid. The fluid is called serous fluid. And all of the serous membranes, no matter which ones you're talking about, they all have the same function. What is that function? We've seen this multiple times before. It is to reduce friction. So that serous fluid, what that does is it allows the membranes, so the visceral and the pleural membranes, to slide past one another so that as you're breathing and you're inhaling and the lungs are expanding and you're exhaling and they're, and they're recoiling back down, instead of rubbing against the wall of the rib cage, it, has, it reduces the friction. Okay, so it helps protect the lungs by reducing the amount of friction that is found um, as you expand. Okay, so that's the same function for all the serious membranes. So if you don't know it now, learn it now, because it's, it's gonna come up over and over again. Okay, so it reduces the friction so that you, so it allows for movement and expansion. Okay, so which one was the serious membrane that closely lines the, the surface of the lungs? So if we're talking about closely lining, if you see the words closely line or on the exterior surface of whatever organ, that's going to tell you visceral. And we're specifically looking for the lungs. So that's going to be pleura. Okay, so the answer is visceral pleura. Where is the pericardium found? The pericardium is around, peri around, cardium as in heart, around the heart. And then peritoneum around the intestines. So that's going to be in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Okay, on to the upper respiratory tract. There's three general regions that we're gonna talk about. We have the nasal cavity, the pharynx, which is basically just the throat, and then the larynx, which is underneath the throat. Okay, in the nasal cavity, oh, I keep moving this around. In the nasal cavity, it is divided in half by a septum. So a septum just means it's a division. And we've seen this before. So remember that the septum has two bones in it. The top part of the bone is created by the ethmoid bone. So the perpendicular plate coming down at the bottom of the ethmoid bone. And then the inferior portion of the bony part is going to be made up by the vomer bone. So we have the ethmoid bone on top, 
and then we have the vomer bone on the bottom. And then the front part of your nose, the front part of your nasal septum is actually created by a cartilage. Okay, so that's why when you look at skulls, you don't see like the front part of the nose. That's because the front part of the nose is, is made up by cartilages. And so the front part will have that cartilage and then it creates a septum that goes all the way down. And so what a deviated septum is, is instead of being right down the middle, it's kind of off to one side. That's a deviated septum. Okay, and then the nasal cavity is going to be lined with a mucous membrane and the function of mucous membranes is to secrete mucus and what this does is it makes it so that the epithelial lining of the nasal cavity is nice and moist so that when you breathe air in that's going to be turbinated which means spun around mixed by the the nasal concha remember you have the superior middle and inferior nasal concha so those are the wave crashing waves that we saw with the bone section and that makes it so the air spins and as it spins what's called turbinates as it turbinates it's going to come in contact with that mucous membrane and that helps moisten the air and moist air is easier to um, diffuse into your body once it gets down into the alveola, which is the low part in the lungs where, where um, gas exchange occurs. Okay, so it helps to warm and humidify the air. And also it helps to trap and, and get rid of um, debris, dust, and pathogens, to bacteria and things that might be in the air as you breathe in. Okay, and then the floor of the nasal cavity is going to be the palate, okay, so also known as the roof of your mouth, and you have the hard palate, and remember that the hard palate is also made up of two bones. The anterior portion of the hard palate is going to be the maxilla, maxilla bone. The posterior part is going to be created by the palatine bone. And then you have a soft palate and the edge of the soft palate continues down and that's gonna be called the uvula. So I'll show you a picture of a uvula in a minute. Okay, so inside of the nasal cavity and the roof of the nasal cavity, that is where you're going to find your olfactory receptors. Into the pharynx. So again, the pharynx is a, it's just another anatomical term for your throat. And the, the pharynx is going to be a common chamber. What I mean by that is that it, that's where food and air is because once you go further down, you get towards the larynx, the larynx is just going to be for respiration. So it's just gonna carry air and the esophagus will be right be behind it. But in the pharynx region here, this is for food and air. Okay, and the pharynx is, is subdivided into three different regions, and the regions are just named by what's kind of in front of them, so it's actually not so difficult. So you have the nasopharynx, which is going to be just posterior to the nasal cavity. Then you have the oropharynx, which is just going to be posterior to the oral cavity. And then you have the laryngo, laryngo as in larynx, which is just going to be posterior to the larynx, which is right in front of that. Okay, so let's look at that oral pharynx. So here is your oral cavity up here. There's your hard palate. The soft palate continues in the back. And then the soft palate kind of falls backwards and creates this little hanging drop thing. <laughs> and that is called the uvula. So there's your uvula. And then this soft palate creates an archway, and the archway is the boundary between the oral cavity and the oropharynx behind it. And that archway has a name, it's called a fossus. Fossus is just the arch in the back here. Okay, so there's the fossus. And then guarding on either side, you have the tonsils. These are specifically the palatine tonsils. And the function of the tonsils is to house immune cells so that you can sort of protect yourself against bacteria. What happens is it has these little like invaginations that the bacteria kind of get into, and then they can be exposed to the immune system and you can propagate immune cells that way. Okay, so the, these, these structures here are called palatine tonsils. You also have tonsils uh, in the 
in the pharynx and then underneath the tongue as well. So a tonsillitis, whenever you see itis at the end of a word, it means it's inflammation of what's ever in front of it. So because those tonsils have those little invaginations to trap the bacteria so that they can be exposed to the, so that they can activate and expose immune cells, sometimes the bacteria get trapped, but then they start to kind of reproduce and then you can get an infection. So an infection of those tonsils is called tonsillitis. And you can tell that it's infected because they're very swollen. Right there, there's the uvula right there. there this is the fossus, the, the, the archway, and all of this pus stuff. Okay, so pus means an active infection because the pus is created by your immune cells as they try to get rid of the infection. Now, tonsillitis is common in some children, especially younger ages, and that's just because it's, it's um, harder to drain the, the, the fluid there. Okay, into the larynx. Okay, so we've gone through the, you know, the nasal, nasopharynx, oropharynx, larynx, and then onto the larynx. And the larynx is just going to be a place for air only, no food should get in. And to prevent the food from giving in, you have the epiglottis, epiglottis, which is this structure right here. This is made up of elastic connective, elastic cartilage, and, it, and what happens is as you swallow, it pushes it down, and that's going to cover the entrance of the larynx there. And then the larynx is supported by two structures that are created by hyaline cartilage, hyaline cartilage. In the front, the big one in the front is called the thyroid cartilage, and I call it, I like to call it the big T, because to me that's what it kind of looks like, it makes like a T shape here. So the big T is the thyroid cartilage, and then the little C, that's what I call it, is the cricoid cartilage underneath it. And the big, the thyroid cartilage is going to be big in the front, but it's not complete anterior, um, posteriorly, which means it's sort of like a half C, it doesn't go all the way back. And you'll notice that all of the other rings, cartilage rings of the, of the trachea, they're also incomplete posteriorly. We'll talk about why later. Okay, so the thyroid cartilage is gonna be big in the front and the cricoid cartilage is gonna be smaller in the front. That's why I call it the little C. To me, it looks like a little C shape here. But the cricoid cartilage is the only cartilage of all the cartilage in the larynx and the trachea that is posterior is complete all the way in the back. And in fact, the cricoid cartilage is bigger in the back than it is in the front. Okay, so there's the cricoid cartilage right there. There's a couple of other little cartilages that we'll get to in a minute. So if you are male especially, females have a little tiny one, but if you are male especially, that little projection, that Adam's apple that you see in the front of the throat, that is um, the, the laryngeal prominence. So prominence as in prominent, sticks out, okay? The laryngeal prominence, that's part of the thyroid cartilage right there. Okay, so just where it kind of comes together to create a point in the front. Okay, the other structures that are found in your, in, your in your larynx are the vocal cords. And as, that, as it sounds like, the vocal cords are for making vocal sounds. And so what happens is you have these little flaps of skin. And in fact, you have two little flaps of skin. The top ones are called the false cords or the vestibular folds. So vestibular folds are the same as false cords because those are the ones that, even though they're flat there, they're not actually the ones that vibrate to make sounds. And then the bottom ones here, those are gonna be called the vocal folds or sometimes the true vocal folds. And that's because those are the little flaps, okay? So what happens is your, your diaphragm forces air up through your trachea and then that air is going to start to vibrate these little flaps of skin. And those little flaps of skin, so here we have the vocal folds right here, they're going to be held at a particular tightness to create different pitches, okay? I'll talk about that in a second. So here we have our vocal folds, which are the second little flaps of skin right there. 
and then they had that space, the slit between them, so the physical space is called the rima glottis, okay, rima glottitis, sorry, rima glottitis, and that creates, so the vocal fold plus the little space between them, the rima glottitis, that makes the glottis, okay, so maybe the epiglottis makes more sense now, epi above, it's above the glottis, it protects the opening of the trachea, which is this little slit-like structure that between the vocal cords, that's the glottis, okay? So as the air is forced up through, it'll create vibrations in the vocal cords, and those vocal cords are going to be held tighter or looser to make different pitches. So when they are loose, they're going to make lower pitches like whoa, 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 whoa. And then when they're held tighter, they're going to make higher pitches like whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Can you hear those? Okay. And the how tight and the angle that they are held are that's accomplished by moving little muscles anchored to a different cartilage, which are called the arytenoid cartilage or are tenoid arytenoid cartilages and the arytenoid cartilage those are these little i guess pyramid shaped structures here and what they do is they have these ligaments that attach the muscles and then the muscles can can tighten and pull on the vocal cords and then also um, change the angle of the vocal cords and that's going to make different types of sounds okay so you can make all different types of sounds with your vocal cords now, the other one that I wanted to point out is on your lab list, you have one that's called the corniculate, and the corniculate cartilages are just the very, very tips, ends of the arytenoid cartilages. So if you're looking at this picture here, this pyramid structure here, this one here would be the arytenoid cartilage, and then this little kind of tip edge of the arytenoid cartilage, this would be the corniculate cartilage. So that one's a little tricky to find, so let's go through that with you. Okay, and then the function of the epiglottis. So again, the glottis is the is the slit, which is the remaglottitis plus the vocal folds. Okay, all together, that's called the glottis. Okay, so down here, this structure shown, this is the glottis, and so this card, this height, this elastic cartilage structure on top of that, that's the epiglottis, so epi above. And what happens is when you are swallowing, that the bulbus, which is the, the partially digested food, is going to push against it and that's going to close and prevent food from going down into the trachea. You don't want food in your trachea, that's called choking. Okay, so we want to prevent choking by covering the larynx so that the food can go down the esophagus, which is just posterior to the larynx. Okay, that's all of the upper resp respiratory structures. Go ahead and move on to the lower respiratory structures.